Before I begin properly, I ought to say that um, I undertook to answer questions at the end of uh, today's lecture. I hope that I shall stop at about, and if I do that, then perhaps I, we might have an interval of two or three minutes in the course of which those who neither wish to ask questions nor wish to hear others do so can perhaps conveniently leave without attracting undue attention to themselves. Um, I s spoke last time about Hamann's anti-rationalism. Let me continue with the exposition of his views so as to give you a more complete picture than I was able to do last time. The word reason was itself something which profoundly irritated and annoyed him. Whenever he sees it, he strikes. Bale made the famous statement, which is really, the, in a sense, the battle cry of the entire Enlightenment, reason is a supreme tribunal and one which judges in the last resort and without appeal everything that is placed before it. This comes from the famous essay on the comet. Hamann quotes this and says, what is this reason with its universality, infallibility, exuberant certainty and obviousness? It ends rationis, a stuffed dummy which the howling superstition of unreason endows with divine attributes. Well, this is a very typical way of speaking for him, that is to say. What he wishes to say is that any form of reification, any form of the erection of any category as some kind of a general criterion for any particular purpose, in a sense, always distorts and caricatures. As I told, tried to say last time, he's the first of the thinkers, at least I think he's the first, it's also dangerous to say this, but he's at least amongst the first of, um, of, of thinkers who start the entire tradition of saying any kind of smoothing out, any kind of generalization is a caricature of the living tissue of life. Death cannot copy life, rest cannot copy movement, words cannot copy reality, and so forth. And this, I think, whenever the word reason comes about in the writings of anyone else, he sees before him a kind of dead framework of some sort, some kind of icy con construction, which appears to him in some way to imprison and to kill the flowing uh, chaos of life, which he sees before him. To resist emotion with logical distinctions is to try and stop the ocean wave with a barrier of sand. Mathematics have never yet curbed passion or done anything to resist or restrain human prejudice. And he quotes Hume again. The points I wish to make, there are three points in order to uh, somehow condense this very, this man's extremely chaotic and wildly, often wildly irrelevant thought into the, what appear to me the, to be the central propositions, at least of historical importance. Let me say this. The first proposition which I wish to impute to him is that he genuinely was a nominalist and an empiricist that with whatever he saw rationalism before him in any shape or form, he attacked immediately. That is to say, the second proposition is about the unity of the spirit and the flesh. The third proposition is about the nature of language. He pictures the history of philosophy as a kind of dead museum of forgotten antiquities in which it is necessary to infuse some kind of breath of life in order to make them live. And when you come to the history of philosophy, what you mainly find there, according to him, are various forms of repression various forms of frameworks, networks of categories, constructions of the reason with which human beings try and shield and protect themselves against perception of reality. The true image, he says, of the average man, the man, the sane, sensible or rational man, is that of a sleepwalker, a man who with infinite sagacity, reflection, coherence, talks, acts, executes perilous enterprises, and does this with greater assurance of touch than he would or could do it if his eyes were even a little open. This is, uh, this is a paradox that almost every other romantic author afterwards echoes. The notion is that sensible men, and even sensible philosophers, are persons who somehow manage to lull themselves into some kind of rigid view of life, who construct some kind of highly artificial schema by which they imprison themselves, who go to sleep, so to speak, on some kind of, on, on, on a comfortable bed of an accepted and unquestioned dogma, and thenceforward, having a, in some way dedicated themselves to some single idée maîtresse, to some single framework, or some single coherent, so-called coherent view of life, proceed then to ignore everything which is exceptional, everything that is real, everything that is palpitating, everything which contradicts all the wrinkles, all the, um, so to speak, chaos, all the irregularities of life, which to Haman is, in fact, reality. And he says, four things I have never understood. The man who seeks the philosopher's stone, the man who wishes to square the circle, the man who wishes to measure the sea, and the man who believes that a man of genius ought to possess common sense. 
and as he was convinced that he, he himself was a man of genius and compared himself to Socrates in this respect, not altogether modestly, his <laughs> life was to a, large, to a large degree devoted to constantly, whenever he saw it, to constantly refuting this constant tendency towards the imprisonment of reality in some categorical scheme. He says there are two types of uh, idolatry to which human beings are addicted. One he calls rational mysticism, the other he calls uh, scientific mysticism. Rational mysticism, which is clearly his name for it, is, for example, the Eleusinian Mysteries. The Eleusinian Mysteries is an attempt to create the illusion on people's part that there is another world to which they can be admitted by some kind of incantations, by some kind of religious exercises, by some sort of mysterious operations by which they escape from the chaos and the unsatisfactoriness of this world into some kind of coherent, luminous, divine world in which um, virtue is rewarded, punish, uh, crime is punished, and otherwise, in some way, some kind of order um, occurs, in, which compensates in some sort of way for the um, dissatisfactions and the irregularities of this world. This is a form of ancient idolatry. Modern idolatry, he says, is much paler uh, and much more, um, much more, in a sense, even foolish, certainly um, a far less vivid version of the same thing, and that is created by the scientists of Paris. There is a religion of science and the religion of Eleusis. Both these are forms of idolatry. Both these are an attempt to erect some kind of dualism by which the world here below is in some way ignored in favor of some imaginary world there above or there behind or there below. Any form of dualism of the sort appears to him to be an offense against the sense of reality. Anything that is ordered, anything which is finite, he seeks to reject. I think it was Spinoza who said, nature, the purpose of nature is uniformity. There is nothing that Harman believed less. He, believed, he liked only diversity, he liked only infinity, anything which appeared to him to be finite or tend towards the finite. Any ambition to try and lock anything up, so to speak, within some kind of coherent schema appeared to him in some way a form of shallowness and, f and foolishness. That is why he tells the story himself how sitting in the garden of the English merchant Green, who was a great friend of Immanuel Kant, sitting in this garden, Kant said, I think not perhaps one of the wisest remarks which Kant made, as you will see, I think that astronomy has finally come to an end. I think everything is known. I don't think new knowledge can now occur. If Kant did say that, as I say, it was not perhaps the most gifted remark. Uh, <laughs> Kant said, Harman said, when he said this, I could strangle him. <laughs> His reason was, Harman's interest in astronomy was not superabundant. He was not interested in natural sciences as we know. On the contrary, he regarded the whole method of the natural sciences as Lebensfeindlich, inimical to life. Nevertheless, the very idea that something is finished, that God couldn't create new stars, new planets, that enormous exceptions couldn't arise, that some enormous outburst of chaotic creative imagination on the part of an unpredictable creator could not occur, that Kant and, or any other scientist was able, in a, with a kind of what appeared to him to be a kind of smug satisfaction, to say, that's that, we've done the job. Astronomy is at an end, now we get on to the next task, whatever it is, the next set of problems. In the natural sciences, it appeared to him to be the most profound misunderstanding and the most limitless arrogance of which contemptible human beings were capable. This is, roughly speaking, the temper in which he speaks. Similarly, whenever he finds any generalizations, whenever he finds Kant talking about categories, about, for example, causality, we already know what he thinks, but when he finds Kant talking about time and space with capital letters as forms of the intuition, he says, time is to me pulse beats. Time is to me heartbeats, the rhythms of nature. Concretely, here, there is no such thing as time, he says with a capital T. There is only this particular piece of duration, there is this particular experience, which is ungeneralizable because sufficiently dissimilar to other similar experiences for any general proposition about time not to be of great significance. Similarly, space is what I feel when I gesture. Space is what I feel when I make a piece of sculpture. Space is something which occurs when I try and mimic the walk of an animal, a, a form of gait, for example. As for space, it is three-dimensional space of which Newton speaks, the box of which Newton and Kant speak, that is a typical fiction of, the, of reason, which again somehow imprisons and limits the imagination of man. Well, the philosophical value of this is not very clear. But at any rate, it is a symptom, so to speak, of the way in which Harman's thought and imagination worked. Anything which represses was um, inimical to him, even Rousseau, for whom he has some respect. He regards, he looks on Rousseau, and he says he looks on Rousseau very much as Socrates looked on Protagoras, as the best of the sophists, but still a sophist. <laughs> and he's a sophist, he's the best of the sophists, but, but just as Protagoras was for, for, for Socrates, because Protagoras understood something about the moral nature of man, though he didn't understand it perhaps in the way in which Socrates wished it understood. Rousseau is, of course, very uh, excellent weapon against the shallow generalizations of Helvetius or Holbach. He understands the 
human emotions. He understands the darker side of human nature in some way which is completely opaque to the, um, for, for Harman at least, the dry, unimaginative, schematizing um, dry as dusts who work in Paris, or for that matter in England too. But Rousseau is mistaken because for one yoke he simply substitutes another. For the yoke of the sociology, psychology, some kind of science of man, or human science or social science, which is constructed on the analogy of mathematics or of natural science, which of course kills everything and smooths and irons everything out, he substitutes the simple man, the open heart, innocence, which nevertheless is also able to perceive some kind of general laws, some kind of huge timeless propositions which all good men at any period, at any time and in any place could see if only they weren't corrupted by their own amour proper or by the devastating or crippling effect upon them of institutions which perhaps they weren't able to help being born into. And this seems to him to be ultimately a deep fallacy. And that is why he attacks the Nouvelle Louise. He likes the Nouvelle Louise as a novel because it appears to him to some degree to show some perception of what might be called the romantic, that's to say the, the emotional nature of man the miseries, the appalling, some, in some ways a description of a s specific psychological tragedy, of, some, of, of, of the pains and agonies of a particular human being in a particular concrete situation, and not to generalize too much. Nevertheless, he says there is absolutely no reason in the world why uh, the heroine, why Julie, should in the end uh, not go off with saint -Preux. Why should she remain with her a dreary, boring husband, Volmar, just because he's virtuous and just because he understands nature and understands the nature of the world. He understands nothing of the kind, he says. The moral, the morality of Rousseau, which is ultimately the conventional morality of Protestantism for, 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 for Harman, is simply the imposition, once again, of some kind of fearful thongs, fearful um, conventional framework upon the wild beatings of the human heart. And therefore, his, Bush is encouraging, his, his criticism of this particular novel is that in the end, Rousseau surrendered. In the end, uh, there is the gloomy trio of Falmar, uh, Julie, and saint -Treu. saint -Treu is unable to marry Julie because she's already married to Falmar. Marriage is sacred. Why should marriage be sacred, says Haman? This needs some reasoning. And he himself, of course, never did marry the lady with whom he lived. He, <laughs> this, uh, this caused a certain amount of shock and piety circles. Nevertheless, his general piety was so great, and the general holiness of his life was regarded as so um, exceptional <laughs> that he was not very much attacked on that score. But the general attitude of Haman is, in this respect, so to speak, is, of course, that there is, we, 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 it is we human beings who impose some kind of barriers between the various aspects of human nature, between reason and the imagination, between the imagination and sense, between sense and understanding, all these categories with which he thinks Kant plays so idly, into which he hacks and cuts the living flesh of reality. All, all this does incredible damage in life itself. And one of the most powerful sermons to be obtained in Haman is about the identification of the spirit and the flesh, that they are in some sense one, and that the ascetic cutting off of the spirit from the flesh, whether it is done by uh, people who believe in the Eleusinian mysteries, or whether it is done by ascetics who follow either Jansenists or German pietists, whoever it might be, is a crime against the, whole, the complete nature of man. Let me read you some characteristic quotations to illustrate this point. The greatest crime, death in life, is to divorce the intellect from the deepest abysses of the most tangible sensuousness. Let there be light. This is an act of creation, sensuous drawing and creation. God himself is made flesh. If God had not been made flesh, he could not discourse to us who are also flesh. But we blasphemously have divided the spirit from the flesh. Gather the fragments together. That is the work in literature of a scholar, in thought of a philosopher, but to imitate them, to shape them, and to live them, that is the work of a poet. And a poet is the highest manifestation for Haman, of man. Reason is a poisonous snake, the arch heretic, the great enemy of God and his truth, the snake in paradise. To divide the flesh from the spirit is blasphemy against God who made us one. We must take Christ's words literally and seek to restore within ourselves a child's view of life. And a child's view of life plainly includes a natural, unashamed sense of the flesh. To tame the passions is to weaken spontaneity and genius. This was a fairly commonplace sentiment of the 18th century. I mean, Diderot would have subscribed to it. Um, um, the German, the Swiss aestheticians would have subscribed to it, but Harman meant it in a much more passionate and much more direct sense. Our philosophers hide with shame, like Adam, their unavoidable and agreeable sin. As man is made in God's image, so is the body a picture of the soul. 
Modern writers, he says, have turned the savage violence of the beasts of the apocalypse into Lessing's harmless moral imagery. They have turned Aesop's ferocious vision into the smooth elegance of Horace. To understand truly, one must descend to the depths of the orgies of Bacchus and Ceres. Newton, Buffo's, and Nervenpick's discoveries cannot inspire poetry, as mythology has only too obviously done. The reason for this is that nature has been killed by the rationalists because they have, do not understand senses, passions, man. Passions alone give abstractions and hypotheses, hands, feet, wings. Images it endows with spirit, life, language. Where, is the, where in science do we find the rolling thunder of eloquence or the monosyllabic brevity of lightning? For this, we must go to artists. For this, we, we cannot go to the modern philosopher. We can go to the Bible, we can go to Luther, but not to the Greeks, to Milton, not the modern French versifiers. Why are the glorious organs of generation objects of shame? Do not speak of general human sentiment on the subject. This isn't true. Children are not full of shame, nor are savages filled with shame, nor are the cynic philosophers. Pudeur is an inherited piece of morality, a heavy duke to consensus. That is to say, by consensus he means middle class sentiment against the Bible, against God, against thunder. If the feelings are mere pudenda, do they therefore cease to be the tools of virility, he says, uh, 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 italicizing these words. The pudenda of our organism are so closely united to the secret depths of our heart and brain that a total rupture of this natural union is in incredible. Then, after that, dash, impossible. The reason is identified by him with repression, not altogether unlike Blake. My coarse imagination, says Harman, has never been able to picture a creative spirit with our genitals. I am born from the inferno of the torso, not the superna of a bust. <laughs> Let me quote two remarks which Blake made on the subject, which I think, roughly speaking, parallel this. What Blake says, for example, that men formed laws of prudence and called them the eternal laws of God. This is a very, very Harmanian sentiment indeed. Children of a future age reading this indignant page know that in a former time, love, sweet, lime was thought, love, sweet love was thought a crime. This is, or could almost be paralleled in a good many of Harman's writings. That, that they may call a, a, a shame and sin love's temple that God dwelleth in, and render that a lawless thing on which his soul expands its wing. This, I think, is uh, almost parallel. It's true, you could say, that both in the case of Blake and in the case of Harman, there is a common mystical tradition, certainly in the case of Blake, Swedenborg, in the case of Harman, very similar thinkers in Germany, who, as often in the writings of mystics, use sensuous and sexual imagery for all kinds of mystical religious emotions. Harman certainly belonged to this company, but he translated it into what might be called secular language, and he was one of the greatest defenders of what might be called spontaneous or natural behavior, um, certainly in his day, whereby he did duly shock respectable persons. On the, for example, on the, on the frontispiece of the Socratic memorabilia of this, his first important um, intellectual essay, he represents himself as the goat-footed god Pan. And this certainly caused a certain amount of surprise and even shock <laughs> in what might be called the more staid circles in Königsberg. The beaux esprit for whom the French are writing will never see the dawn of the rising day, for they do not believe in the resurrection of the flesh. How can fastidious modern converseurs do anything, since they are ashamed of nature, cover her up, concern themselves only with the pretty clothes with which they hide her? And then he says, rules are the vestal virgins who populated Rome thanks to the exceptions which they perpetrated. This is a very typical Harmanian joke. Fig trees, he says, which provide us very usefully with leaves to cover our shame, nevertheless, only feed us by allowing their fruit to drop. Now, these kind of images, particularly about the Vestal Virgins, is a very typical Harman sentiment because the proposition is rules are important, but it is also important to break them. The rules exist for the purpose of being broken in exceptional cases. Anything which pretends to have any kind of degree of universal validity is a human fiction invented to constrict the spirit. And there is a perpetual propaganda in Harman against what might be called repression in all its forms. Anything which somehow imprisons the living spirit, whether in the form of philosophical constructions or in the form of political organization or in the form of language. Let me come to his linguistic theory which is, an, is simply another illustration of this, of this self-same thesis. The origins of language were, quite, uh, were a very lively subject in the middle of the 18th century. 
all kinds of theories developed about the origins of language, whether all kinds of uh, rival views were expressed about whether language was in fact an invention, a kind of gadget, like the wheel, for example, or the screw, which were beings invented for certain purposes, or whether, on the contrary, it was a gift bestowed upon man by God. If you read, for example, Condillac, or if you read Lord Monbodo, you would find that they believed that language came into being as a result of certain biological or physiological needs. In Condillac, it is a genuine physiological need. In Monbodo, it's even a little more conscious. Human beings seeking to um, communicate, seeking to express themselves, and finally that incoherent noises and gestures um, didn't perform this particular task sufficiently. Well, um, proceed in some almost conscious sense, almost, not quite, to invent language exactly as one invents a chair, a table, the screw, as one uses fire. That is to say, it is a specific invention generated by human beings in a utilitarian spirit at a certain point of human evolution. This was denied very hotly by theologians, led by a German theologian called Süßmilch, who pointed out, uh, quite correctly, that there was something illogical about this hypothesis, that in order to invent human beings must think that one thinks in symbols that for that is what thought is and therefore one cannot invent symbols because since one uses them for the purpose of invention one cannot invent the act of inventing well this and therefore the cart is put down before the horse um, in 1772 the Berlin Academy offered a prize for the best essay on the origins of language and Herda wrote one and obtained the prize Herda was a very faithful disciple of Hamann and here I put forward what might be called intermediate theory of language, neither the first nor the second, neither a priori nor wholly empirical. He said that, of course, it was Zeus' it was perfectly right to suppose that human beings couldn't suddenly have invented language like that. Uh, they couldn't have invented language because, presumably, words, symbols, the whole systematic use of certain marks on paper, or certain noise sounds, for certain purposes, couldn't have been used by human beings until and unless their consciousness, their reason, their faculties had developed to a certain degree. And when their faculties, their consciousness, their reason had developed to this degree, then the very development of the consciousness and the faculties to this degree was, in fact, the use of symbolism. The use of symbolism was itself a natural, organic development of human faculties in a certain direction. Therefore, it was impossible to suppose that this was something which human beings had suddenly thought of. I mean, having not had language on a Tuesday, they suddenly, someone came, m m m m m m produced a brilliant invention, and on Wednesday, suddenly, this wonderful liberating instrument came to being called language, after which we've never looked back. That, Herda correctly denied. On the other hand, he didn't see why this nature should be right, who maintained that language was a kind of gift of grace, that human beings were completely inarticulate before, suddenly God dropped language into their lap as a free gift of grace. And with surprise and gratification, they suddenly observed themselves, they didn't themselves know how, in possession of this miraculous faculty. That appeared to him equally irrational, equally illogical, equally improbable, historically speaking. And therefore, he produced a very sensible naturalistic theory by which reason and speech being interwoven develop as one, and therefore there isn't a specific problem about the invention of speech, just as there isn't a specific problem about the invention of reason, or the invention of the imagination, or the invention of sight, or the invention of hearing, or the invention of articulation. These things occur as they do. Hamann was quite pleased with the essay, so far as it went against Lord Monbodo, or against um, Condillac, or against Harris, or against various other theories in the 18th century, but it was a little over-naturalistic for him. And he wrote to Herder and he said, this in a sense will do, but you've left out the divine. You've left out God. You've left out the fact that God speaks to us, and we understand God who speaks to us because he speaks to us, and he has made us capable of understanding him. He has made everything. Somehow you implant in insensible nature that which belongs to God. Herder was uh, moved by this. He admired Hamann more than any other living man. He described himself as a camel driver who collects the golden apples which fall from the lap of the holy man sitting on the camel as he reads the Koran. And being in this mood, on the whole, retracted. Retracted partly because he wished to please Hamann and partly, I dare say, because he was a Protestant clergyman. And it ill behooved the Protestant clergyman to deny the powers of God and to deny, indeed, um, the, the doctrine of natural kinds, which in this particular essay he did, on the whole, tend uh, to deny. But he did, he, nevertheless, Hamann was stimulated by Herder's errors, as he, it seemed to him, to his own theory of language, which is somewhat analogous, but not entirely. Now, the, the, the thing, of course, which powerfully <coughs> moved uh, Hamann's indignation to the highest possible pitch of intensity was the remark of the Abbe Dubas, who was an eminent French aesthetician of this particular period, who said, what one has felt and thought in one language, one, express with, one can express with equal elegance in any other. This appeared to be Hamann to be one of the least voracious remarks ever made by a human being. <laughs> he said that our cast of mind is entirely based on sensuous impressions. That sensuous impressions and associated feelings, as he calls them, 
occur differently in different organisms in different climates and in different circumstances. Um, if you wish to understand the Bible, he says, you must comprehend the oriental character of the eloquence of the flesh that takes us to the cradle of our race and religion. Images come before words, and images are created by passions. And passions are not analogous in men under different circumstances. He then says, every man is unique, every man possesses his own particular character, and words Symbols are the natural expression of these unique human beings. There may be certain similarities, but what is important, of course, as always for him, is the unique particular quintessence which every human being in some way incorporates and which he expresses in the particular use of symbols which he, uh, which he employs. The central proposition of Harman is that there is no difference between words and thoughts. And this, for his time, was a moderately bold thing to say. It is not the case that there is something called ideas, for which you look for, such that you look for words, as it were, like gloves to fit these ideas. It is not the case that you think in thoughts and then look for something called words, noises, marks on paper, symbols, pictures, whatever it may be, in which to incorporate these thoughts for the purpose of commun communicating them to others. If you, cannot think, if you cannot use symbols, you are not thinking at all. Thinking is symbol using. Thinking is using either images or words. That is these two acts are literally identical for him. For this reason, language and thought are one like God and his Shehina, like God and his tabernacle, he says. Every court, every school, every profession, every closed corporation, every sect, each has and must have its own vocabulary. How do we penetrate them? We can penetrate them only with the passion of a friend, a lover, an intimate, by faith, by belief, not by rules. And why, how, why, why is this so? Because the uniqueness of each human being is expressed by his gestures, is expressed by his facial expression, is expressed by the spasmodic movements which he makes, is expressed by his gait, by the way in which he gets up, by the way in which he sits down, by a thousand small and unconsidered movements of his body and his soul, which for, for him, of course, are one. That being so, language, symbolism, is one of the means of expression of this particular uniqueness. And therefore, the attempt to say that one can draw up um, rule, rules for language, and that these rules are in some sense artificial rules, and that language submits to artificial rules exactly as, say, mathematics, which really is a human invention, submits to artificial rules, and that language is in some sense a tool, a gadget, an invention, and therefore is capable of being analyzed into something which human beings have either discovered or invented for it, must be false. You can no more invent language than you can invent feeling, than you can invent thought, than you can invent any other natural human activity. And of course, uh, um, for him, there is a specific mystical analog to this. The mystical analog is that when Adam was in paradise, then God spoke to him. He spoke to him in such a manner that Adam, that Adam understood everything because the language in which God spoke was a language which he had already, the understanding which he implanted in Adam. And he understood without having to learn the language painfully as sometimes we have to. And the world, the very notion of the world, so to speak, what, the, what a world is, the whole notion of articulated experience, the whole notion of, the, say, the distinction between the external and the internal world, the distinctions of colors and shapes, the distinction of any kind of category and concepts in terms of which we try and describe and um, contrast objects in the world, all this is the function of language. Not only can you not do it without language, but to do it is to use language. That is what language is. It is the function of discriminating, of comparing, of saying, of thinking, of feeling. Even in feeling, says Haman, there is some kind of occult symbolism occurs. That is to say, as soon as it becomes self-conscious. Once it becomes self-conscious, symbolism is somehow intermixed with it. Now, if that is so, then there is a certain sense in which your world is your symbols. There isn't a world stretched in front of you, a kind of rerum natura, a sort of given, coherent, articulated entity, and then you have to invent something or other with which to cover it, with which to articulate it, with which to translate it. And that is why it's obviously absurd to say that a thing which can be stated in one language can be stated with equal elegance in every other. What can be said in French cannot be fully said in German. What can be said in German cannot be fully said in English. Because these languages are the unique expressions of unique individuals living in unique circumstances and in some way express differences as deeply as they express similarities. And what you can skim off, which is what the scientists do, that is to say, what you can skim off, if you do produce a generalized language of a highly conceptual kind, which is extremely formal in its structure, simply invented for the purpose of catching similarities and omitting what are regarded as the irrelevant differences. When you, in other words, when you invent a perfect translating machine, then what you catch with it is for Haman not worth catching. He doesn't, I don't say that he would deny that this was possible, but his point is, we use language for the purpose of experience. 
we, when we meet people, which is to him the most important of all phenomena, when we speak to other human beings to, or to God, we wish to be understood and we wish to understand them. This cannot be done by me, any kind of application of mechanical rules. These things are at most some kind of aid, but they certainly are not the key to understanding. Understanding is a unique act of mutual recognition which is not susceptible to rules in as much as it is of necessity unique and of necessity sufficiently dissimilar to other such acts to be of supreme value in itself, something of that kind. He never, he, as, as you may perceive, he exaggerates. He exaggerates, and indeed, one can say about him, as one can say about other thinkers, that very few thinkers, the thought of very few thinkers has survived who did not exaggerate. But Hamann perhaps exaggerates a little too much. At any rate, he supposes that philosophy is entirely concerned with words. And this is a very modern sounding statement. He certainly supposes that metaphysics and philosophy, whether true or false, is not concerned with things. It is concerned, if you like, with concepts, if you like, with categories, but these concepts and categories are words. All idle talk about reason is mere wind, he says. Language is its organon and criterion. Language is like currency. Men of genius can use it, but officials, of course, turn it, as they do everything, to sterile dogmatism, which they proceed to offer for their own worship by the people. And among these sterile officials, he includes metaphysicians and philosophers of his own time. Creation is speech. Through language are all things made. This mysterious statement really means that God created the universe by an act of some kind of which is attenuate analogous to some sort of conscious act which is analogous to thinking. Just as God therefore must have in some sense implanted, created the world or articulated it in a kind of, by using, as Harman supposes, those sacred symbols of which we sometimes catch glimpses if only we attend to the words of the Bible sufficiently closely, so we, when we ask ourselves what the world is like, can only operate by means of our symbols and our words which are not detachable from the world to which they apply. Indeed, they don't apply to anything, they are part of it. The whole of the Harman doctrine is that the notion of dividing the words and what the words are about, objects and symbols, is one more instance of this appalling act of diremption, of cutting, of abstraction, of division, which has bedeviled the entire history of rational thought. That is why the cardinal sin for Harman is to mistake, as he says, to mistake words for concepts and concepts for real things, which metaphysicians have done from the beginning of time. Reason is language, logos. On this marrow bone, I gnaw and shall gnaw myself to death on it. He said to Herder three years before he died. <laughs> every, every phenomenon of nature, let me give you a typical mystical passage by, by Harman, so as not to make him out too modern a philosopher, too, too much of a modern linguistic philosopher, although the, you, you, you will perceive certain affinities, because the very notions we speak, that philosophy is about language, the paralogisms of, of the understanding which Kant talks about, for example, in Critique of Pure Reason, according to Harman, are simply paralogisms of words, language. If we get into paradoxes, as Kant tries to prove, if we get into contradictions of a certain kind, these contradictions are not due to the mistaken function of a certain faculties on our part. Faculties can't make mistakes, says Harman. Faculties, faculties just operate, so to speak, besides which there are no faculties. There is only one, uh, so to speak, act of cognition. All these divisions into intuition, understanding, imagination, fancy, uh, reason, vernunft, verstand, all these words, all this is idle chatter for him. There is only some kind of cognition or some kind of action, and cognition and action are one, of course, for him. In some sense, to re recognize the world is already to take up an attitude towards it. To take up an attitude towards it is to act in a certain fashion. And therefore, thought and action are in some sense one, and he may be, for this reason, also be regarded as one of the fathers of the famous theory of the unity of theory in practice. Well, every phenomenon of nature was a word, a sign, symbol, or pledge of a new, inexpressible, but all the more intimate union, communication, and community of divine energy and ideas. Everything that man heard in the beginning and saw with his eyes, contemplated, all that his hands touched was a living word, for God was the word. With this word in his mouth and in his heart, the origin of language was as natural, as near, and as easy as child's play. That's how it was with Adam in paradise. After that, there was a the fall, human arrogance, the Tower of Babel, and the terrible cold destruction made by philosophical reason. Rational religion is a contradiction in terms like rational language. There is nothing which Hama would have rejected with more fervor and indignation than the notion of a logically perfect language, or a logically correct language. The notion that there is a kind of rerum natura, there is a structure of reality, to which of an adjust language as a kind of grid or as a kind of machine would have appeared to him to be the denial of the most self-evident of all facts. One of the little tracts 
in which he makes it clear what his attitude is towards language, is a very peculiar and very typical little pamphlet which he produced, which is called The Apologia of the Defense of the Letter H, which he published sometime in the 70s. It arose as follows. There was a perfectly respectable Lutheran theologian called Damm in Berlin, who, in the course of offering various suggestions about the possible etymological reform of German, suggested that the letter H, when it came after consonants in German, or when it came at the ends of words, played no part, had no use. It didn't add to the actual sound, and therefore, for reasons of utility, might as well be dropped. This aroused Harman's rage in no uncertain manner. <laughs> he said that the letter H, of course, was exactly as it had been described as being. Certainly it was of no use. The notion of getting rid of things because they were of no use seemed to him the worst of all possible reasons for any form of action at all. He says, the letter H, to, Dumb wishes to get rid of this poor letter H, he says, in order to create a stick and span world, a kind of swept and garnished world in which everything shall be useful, everything shall be clear, everything shall be elegant, and everything shall be symmetrical. One can already foresee, so to speak, what the nature of the criticism is going to be. <laughs> this leaves out from the world everything which is irregular, everything which is irrational, all it leaves is liability to sufficient reason. If things don't have sufficient reason, out for them. Sufficient reason, says uh, Haman, is a lamentable, poor, blind, naked little thing. Your life, says the letter H suddenly, addressing itself to Baron Grimm in Paris, who supported uh, Dumb in this matter, your life is what I am myself, a breath, and how, H. <laughs> God has created poor little useless H but he will not be allowed to perish from the earth, says Haman suddenly. And then there's a tremendous hymn to God, which immediately follows. Those who wish to prove God by design have no faith in such as me, says the letter H. Such a God exists only by the logic of vain, puffed-up logicians, and the logician is obviously prior to the God whom he creates. In such a universe, I, little H, could not survive. But thanks to the true God, I do and shall. It is no great distance to this. And from then, you see, Haman goes on to defend every kind of ancient institution. You can see the door is then opened to a tremendous romantic defense of everything which is useless but old, useless but has a meaning for people, useless but expresses in some unique way the impalpable, the immeasurable, the, the unanalyzable essence of something which reason condemns. He says that um, ancient institutions and abuses must be defended because if they are suppressed, then there is a danger that the soul will be killed altogether, as the French reformer obviously seemed to be doing. In a world, he says, built by Helvetius, there will be no color, no novelty, no genius, no thunder, no lightning, no agony, no transfiguration. That is what, of course, Goethe meant in that famous passage when he talks about, um, Goethe talks about, about his life in Strasbourg when um, he was young in the 1770s and he met... Herder, who was, I think, suffering with some kind of uh, disease of the eyes, and Herder made him um, preach to him what, in effect, he had learned from Hamann. Referring to Holbach's famous Système de la Nature, which is a famous atheistical and naturalistic work, Goethe says, we could not conceive how such a book could be dangerous. It appears to us so dark, so cold, so cimmerian, so corpse-like, that we found it difficult to endure its presence and shuddered at it as at a ghost. The author imagines that he gives the book a special recommendation when he says in its preface that as a decrepit old man, just sinking into the grave, he wishes to declare the truth to his contemporaries and to posterity before he dies. We laughed at him. Old churches, we said, have dark windows. To know how cherries and berries taste, we must ask children and sparrows. These were our jibes, these were our maxims. How hollow and how empty we felt in this melancholy, atheistical half-night in which the earth vanished with all its images, heaven with all its stars. That is a direct Harmanian doctrine. Without Haman, Herder would certainly not have believed these things, and without Herder, Goethe is scarcely likely to have spoken them. That was, so to speak, the way in which these particular doctrines were transformed into Goethe's prose, and in this way achieved what might be called a world stage and world fame. This is Haman's doctrine of language, and from this it's no great distance, so to speak, to his political views, which I think I might say something about here too. He believes, because of the letter H, that everything old, everything decrepit, everything which is ancient must be preserved. He obviously thinks that the crooked alleyways of the past mustn't be straightened out for fear of losing something impalpable. This is rather like his friend Mirza, who uh, practiced conservatism of a very analogous order. Our ancestors knew what they were doing by altering 
things too much, by straightening things out, by sweeping the universe too clean, we are removing that in it which is dear to us, which gives us a sense of our real identity and past general conservative doctrine. Haman went further than this. He, in a course of an attack on a book called Master and Servant by a, a, a well-known German, enlightened German bureaucrat called Karl Heinrich von Moser, Karl Friedrich von Moser, which was a peer to enlightened despotism, in fact, Haman says, so that is what we are to believe. The enlightened despot on the top and everyone else below. This is the rational universe. And he proceeds to identify in a very typical fashion political absolutism, scientific rationalism, and generalizing propositions in every in the sphere of aesthetics. Despotism and aesthetics on the part of the Abbe Bateau and the Abbe Dubos precisely corresponds to enlightened despotism on the part of von Moser's despot and precisely corresponds to the general propositions which Helvetius and Holbach would like us to substitute for the intuitive, rather somewhat more, um, rather more crooked, so to speak, less elegant, less symmetrical views which men naturally live by. Constitution, says Hamann. A constitution is something which can be written. A constitution is something which can be published. A constitution cannot be believed in. A constitution cannot be lived, and we need something in terms of which life can be lived. Therefore, all these attempts to create some kind of schema whereby rational organization takes the place of that chaotic growth which God has stimulated by his imaginative gifts as the artist of the universe, the attempt to alter that which God has created in the direction of some kind of rules or formulae which God can plainly not have stimulated and cannot have stimulated or has stimulated merit to our doom, cannot have stimulated at least in his capacity as a benevolent creator as you will discover by reading the Bible which is chaotic and rightly so. There's always this harking back, there's always contrast between the smooth generalizations of the French and the thunder and the lightning and the chaos and the dark woods of the Bible of Luther and so forth. Since this is so, this is what spells our doom. He came back to the attack against Mendelssohn and against Kant. The position about Mendelssohn was quite an interesting one. In a sense, they were friends. Mendelssohn was his first publisher. He thought Hamann, as I told you in my first lecture, was an interesting man with touches of brilliance. He published some of his writings in his Berlin publication, he and Nikolai. And then, uh, towards the end of his life, published a celebrated work called uh, Jerusalem, which was really a plea for toleration for minorities in general, and the Jews in particular. And in it, he develops a perfectly conventional view, which a great many persons at that period held, and which, of which Mendelssohn gives a perfectly eloquent, though not perhaps a very first-hand exposition, about the relations of the church to the state and about the foundations of political life in general. And he says, echoing Spinoza, echoing to some extent Locke, echoing a good many rationalists in the 18th century, that after all, the state is founded upon two great foundations, natural law and the contract. Natural law is that which any reasonable being perceives to be true. That is what the Stoics have told us, that is what Cicero has told us, that is what St. Thomas has told us. As for promises, this is a social contract which must be kept because the keeping of contracts, pactas and servanda, is itself a part of natural law. Now, if this is so, then since the state is founded upon this rational foundation, since the whole moral foundation of the state rests upon the existence in it of rational men who have, with rational freedom, undertaken to live a certain kind of life, to obey a certain kind of government, not to perform certain acts because they're antisocial in character, and to obey the laws provided they are passed in a form of which they approve, of, of which is rational in character. Since this is so, any state which suppresses rationality suppresses its own foundations. It can repress conduct, which it may not like, because this conduct is dangerous to the foundations of the state as such. It can repress opinion where this opinion is dangerous. But to impose violent censorship, to impose unanimity, for example, of religion, to impose unanimity of moral opinions against human, against the freedom of rational beings, is in some sense to cut off the metaphysical or moral branch on which the state itself, in some sense, may be said to be sitting. Well, this was not, as I say, a very unconventional point of view. This is quite normal. And uh, Mendelssohn published this in, in the interest of the Jews, who he said possessed a religion which was indeed different from that of Christians, but their actions were in no way departed from the normal conventions of the time. They were good citizens. 
all that men could be expected to do in a state was to obey its laws. If they obeyed its laws and did not preach any doctrine which was subversive of the state, then their religion was a private affair because they had a right as rational beings to make a choice of that which they believed, provided this was not in itself subversive of life together, something of that kind. And this was enough for a plea for the state to keep its hands off religion, the state to keep its hands off moral and theological beliefs. Haman is exceedingly indignant. He says, so the state is founded on contract. In other words, if it were possible by reason to refute uh, the proposition, say, that the contract had been entered into by me or by my ancestors, or if it were possible by reason to refute the proposition that natural law is such as Isidore of Seville says it is, or such as St. Thomas says it is, or somebody else says, if, it's possible, if it were possible to disprove this, then the state would dissolve at once. It would disintegrate immediately. It would fall into pieces. Nobody but a fool could believe this. The state is an ancient product of human symbiosis. It is something which is created by the intercommunication of human beings whose emotions, intuitions, flesh, as well as spirit, we can go back to all the regular Harmanian theses at this point. All these faculties on the part of men, or if they are not to be called faculties, all these means of interlacing on the part of human beings, which is what men are. For men are organically and essentially intercommunicating beings, for they cannot be conceived in any other terms. All this is not the product of reason. This is the product of life together. This is the product of love, of hatred, of jealousy, of ambition, of the worship of God, of all kinds of complex and unanalyzable human relations. He speaks a language which is somewhat similar to that of Burke, but a great deal more extravagant and a great deal more violent. And Mendelssohn tells us that if these propositions were in some way refuted or even contradicted, then this whole structure would fall to pieces, as if it was a house of cards held together by nothing more than mere rational agreement. Even the justification of it cannot be regarded as that, because there is no such thing as justifying what there is. We don't justify trees. We don't justify animals. We don't justify the imagination. We don't justify thought. We don't justify man. Why on earth, then, should we justify something which is equally natural, equally indestructible, equally uh, in, so to speak, eternal, namely society. And as for the state, it is simply a particular form which this society has taken in the course of natural, irregular, um, uh, crooked, essentially asymmetrical um, uh, growth, which is naturally hostile to the artificial reason of the Paris reasoners. He then goes on to say, and what is more, Mendelssohn wants us to believe that religion should take its proper place in the state. This means that God must know where he belongs. He mustn't go out the proper bounds which are set for him by the civic authorities. Religion is something which mustn't interfere with the normal civilized habits of men. You can imagine the kind of reaction which Hamad produces against this. And there follows a very violent and very passionate sermon to the effect that the very notion that the most sacred things there are, that our faith in God, that, are the, that by which we live our lives, the most sacred principles of all, our communication with our maker, which is the whole of the end and goal of our existence. To relegate this to be simply another province of life, like paying taxes, like serving in the army, like any other, so to speak, normal function of human being, that is a form of the profoundest possible blasphemy against nature, against man, and against God. In short, he's pleading for what ultimately comes to some kind of loose anarchistic theocracy. He says, so to speak, that the notion of saying religion is all very well in its place, but it really won't do if it interferes with the serious concerns of life, which is a parody or caricature, which he produces Mendelssohn, that this, in some sense, is an absolute denial of all that is most important and most profound in human, in individual, and in social existence. He then uh, transfers his attack to Kant, whom he was rather fond of baiting. He liked Kant personally. Kant lent him money. Kant was kind to him. Kant thought he was rather mad, but on the whole was amiable to him and said, when these men talk, I never know whether to regard him as a man of genius or as an ape of genius, he said. <laughs> if the latter, then all we can do is simply continue with our own work quietly, steadily, assiduously, and taking no notice of these eccentricities, and did so. Kant, he says, as a loyal Prussian, in a little pamphlet called What is the Enlightenment, which was really an attack upon fraternity's government, which should have pleased Harman to that extent. Kant said, if the prince or the sovereign orders me to do something that I deem to be wrong, I must, as a private person, still more as an official, carry it out. I have no right to disobey, but as a rational being, being a member of a rational society, I have a duty to criticize such an order. I am a combination, on the one hand, of a private person, and on the other, of a publicist or a philosopher, a theologian or a professor, whose duty it is, of course, always to speak out. Harman says, so, a professor is at once a master and a slave, a guardian and a minor, an adult and a child. So the public use of reason and liberty is but a desert, 
whereas the private use of these excellent things is a daily bread that one must give up the better to taste the dessert. In public, I wear the trappings of freedom as professor, while at home I have nothing but the rags of a slave as the obedient servant of Frederick the Great. What on earth is the use of this, he says? Faith alone gives us strength to resist guardians and tutors who not only kill our bodies but empty our pockets. And we cannot do this by main means of Kant's abstract goodwill. And there follows a tremendous attack on intellectuals of this type who subvert natural human morality. And he goes on to say, obedience to reason is simply a call to open rebellion. Nikolai, who was Mendelssohn's co-editor in Berlin, and a very reasonable, amiable, high-minded, and tolerant man, who did a very great deal for German enlightenment and education, said, once said to Hamann, there is room in the, in the world for both of us. After all, we don't understand each other. <laughs> Hamann said, certainly not. There is not room for both truth and falsehood. One or other must perish in the fight. Rationalists, philosophers, scientists, Jews, foreigners must be kept in their place. Now, this, of course, in a sense, so to speak, has a sinister note, because it embodies in one a kind of um, anti-rationalism, anti-intellectualism, a kind of demotic patriotism which was there in Harman, the roots of some kind of uh, faith in the deep irrational instincts of the common people against the murderous and dehydrating effect of highbrow intellectuals, which afterwards certainly entered as an ingredient into all kinds of chauvinistic exhibitions in Germany and ultimately entered in as an element in fascism itself. Hamann himself, be it said to his honor, never took part in the persecution of rationalism which did occur after the death of Frederick the Great. He was too eccentric, too isolated, too queer, too much on his own to do any of these things. Nevertheless, there is no doubt that this kind of propaganda undoubtedly did enter into the general brew of what might be called anti-intellectualism, anti-rationalism, illiberalism, and, um, so to speak, um, um, the, the kind of um, collective emotionalism which afterwards developed into all kinds of irrationalist movements in the 19th century. I fear that I must end. Um, finally, let me say this. If you say what, why should Hamann be paid any attention to at all? Well, the, of course he exaggerated. And as I say, as all philosophers who ever made a mark, I think, or nearly all exaggerated. Erasmus didn't exaggerate, and we don't read him. Thomas Reed didn't exaggerate, and we don't read him much. If you ask yourself about the great thinkers of the world, I think you will find that they, generally speaking, exaggerated. Hamann lived at a time when there is no doubt that there was a considerable simplification of what might be called the sociology and psychology and general uh, attitudes towards what men were and society was. And this, in some way, outraged him. And he naturally went too far in the opposite direction in trying to restore what he regarded as the proper balance in this particular respect. He constantly tries to break through the crust of what might be called complacency, of what might be called smugness, of the general acceptance of scientific formulae as the key to life. He saw a world in which it appeared to him that human beings were broken up in which we were over-specialized. If you wish to put it in sociological terms, I suppose it's possible to suppose that Harman was really a 17th century man who survived into the 18th century, rather as Dr. Johnson was in England. That he lived in the enlightened state of Frederick the Great. Frederick the Great was undoubtedly trying to make Prussia the most powerful and the most important state in Germany, and he was going there by forced marches. Um, he produced an agricultural crisis by his mercantilist policy. He introduced education and then was unable to provide sufficient employment for the children of poor but educated men. He um, drove his, his subjects, both military and civilian, in a very ruthless manner and stamped upon all kinds of ancient institutions, altered them, rationalized them, centralized them, and altogether vigorously tried to make an extremely modern state out of Prussia, which to some degree he succeeded in doing, somewhat in a manner, though perhaps not quite so violently, as Peter the Great in Russia. Hamann was, in some sense, the voice, Hamann's voice was the voice of a toad beneath the harrow. In some sense, he was the man whose universe was being shot to pieces, whose universe, whose whole emotional and, so to speak, cultural uh, tendencies were towards something older, something much far less rationalistic, and who simply saw in Frederick the Great, whom he calls contemptuously the Solomon of Prussia, simply a, a, an Ahab who takes away Naboth's vineyard, he, Hamann, being Naboth. Simply um, a wicked king who um, puts up a lot of um, wooden idols before his people in the form of reason, science, symmetry, order, 
all these totally inhuman values into which human flesh is being ground and by which some kind of appalling uniformity is being introduced in what was before that, at least for him, a world of living and therefore asymmetrical beings. And that is, I suppose, in some sense, the reason for and the essence of this particular cri de coeur. Certainly, a great many of the things which Harman said were plainly not true. His attacks on Kant missed the point. His, he failed to perceive the critique of pure reason was a profound philosophical work. His proposition that general propositions should never be used or that concepts and categories are of no use is quite obviously meaningless. A great many of the charges which he levels at French science and French historical writing are beside the point. Let me say one more thing. I don't think Harman cared in the least about science and history. I think he, if he was told that scientists were simply curious about the way things were and wished to predict and control them, he wouldn't have minded. I think he was told that if what historians wanted to do was simply to discover how things happened and use them as rational methods for the purpose of reconstructing the past, he would perhaps have agreed. But these things were of no interest to him. He was not curious about the past, and he was not interested in ordering human lives. He was not interested in social facts as such. He was, as many such persons are, completely blind to human misery around him. He was not interested in social problems. He was a man who was completely absorbed in some kind of act of mystical illumination of his own, so to speak, within himself. And as often happens to such people, he saw most clearly because he looked fanatically out of one window. But out of that window, he did certainly see what others did not see. And without Hamann, neither Herder nor the German Romantic movement, nor all its consequences, both um, deleterious and beneficent, is, I think, altogether thinkable. Next week, I propose, uh, tomorrow, I mean, I propose to talk about a very, the very different figure of the Nestor. I shall now stop for about two or three minutes.